Hello, Salt Strong Nation. Joe Simons, like Diamonds, back again. This is going to be a fun one, and we want your feedback. We want to see some comments down here. Regardless if you're listening, make sure you go to saltstrong.com, and you'll see this in the fishing tip section. If you're watching on YouTube, leave a comment. So the topic here is Texas redfish versus Florida redfish versus the Carolina redfish. That's North and South Carolina. Obviously, I know there's some redfish in some states in between, but our three guests here, our panelists, if you will, our redfish experts, if you will, have lived in or currently live in one of those states and have fished those states. Uh, Luke just got back, a little trip with Wyatt there at Bay Flats Lodge in Texas. And uh, and obviously Luke you know, lives here in Florida where we're filming this. And we came back today and fished for redfish. Pat's now in Georgia, but has been in the Carolinas. So we're going to talk about the similarities and the differences because there are some differences um and end of the day you know we always say a redfish is a redfish is a redfish but there are some differences pat was just kind of making fun of you know some of the redfish and other states i won't name which ones because we want to hear your feedback on the the best state which state do you think is best for catching redfish uh but but there are some little nuances and we'll talk about that so this is going to be fun and educational in terms of helping you go out there and catch more redfish so Guys, first and foremost, what do you think? Can you pick a state, or is that too tough for you? I'll say Texas is is way better than I was expecting. Mm. I was I was really was blown away, and uh, just from that trip, I would say Texas just has more. Like it was it was insane how much good water there was, and not only that, as far as having good structure with bait, but not just how much how much good air there was but how few boats relative to here in like tampa bay florida how few boats were out there targeting them so they were way less spooky and and more of them i would argue more more fish as well so like that combo was the most uh impressive thing out of that trip it was uh it was insane yeah, I'll be a little yeah. bit biased here, being that I'm in, in Texas right now. And there's one one small thing that I think contributes to it, but I do think Texas does have the best red fishery out there. Um, I'll mention what that one thing is later, but like Luke said, the fish here are extremely cooperative. There's a huge population of them, and there's not a lot of anglers that are messing with them. Luckily, Texas has some of the largest running bay systems in the entire United States. Uh, and there are a lot of anglers that go out there and fish, but you could fish your whole life here in Texas and not fish the same spot every single day. Uh, there is a lot of cooperative fish out there. There's a lot of different environments like we're going to talk about. I do personally think even though you've got a redfish that's in Texas, that redfish will have the exact same biology and patterns as a redfish in Florida, in the Carolinas. It doesn't matter where it's at. A redfish is a redfish is a redfish. But one thing like we're going to talk about is your approach might be different depending on that habitat that that fish is in. Even a Texas redfish, depending on where you are in the state, might not be the same as a redfish in a different region in Texas. You know, north, north coast Texas redfish up in Sabine and Galveston, they don't have the exact same habits as the ones that are in South Texas in Corpus or in South Padre. Uh, and even as you go into the Carolinas, uh, like I'm sure Pat's going to talk about, he's over in Georgia right now. All those fish, depending on that region, uh, they have the same biology, same feeding patterns, but your approach is going to be different depending on where you're fishing for them. Good stuff. You know, I, you I hear you guys talking about Texas, and I, and I agree. Texas is uh, is good. Uh, one of the things about Texas, the, the hardest part about fishing for redfish in Texas is getting to the fish. Once you get to the fish, it's pretty easy. Uh, but if you've ever heard of a body of water called the Pamlico Sound in North Carolina, I might say that might be the best, best red fishery in the nation, especially when it comes to giant redfish. Mm. I mean, that place is absolutely awesome. And, uh, you know, pretty much all the North Carolina, the Sound, South Carolina, it's just, it's a different type of fishery. You know, you, you fish for them the same kind of way, using the same lures and the same method. But, uh, you know, words like shallow and deep and high tide, low tide, they, they have a different effect and they have a different meaning there. But the overall the way that you're fishing for them is, is pretty much the same as, you know, kind of it is in Florida and in Texas. You just have a little bit of changes. Good stuff. Luke, you wrote a book that is out there. If you guys want a free copy of it, uh, we'll make sure to put a link in the show notes at saltron.com and get a, a PDF copy for, for free. And in that, you, you in the very beginning, you talked about, you know, redfish is redfish is redfish. And there were some things 
that all redfish have in common. And there's some things that as anglers, we need to focus on regardless of where we are. One was like maximizing structure, right? Maximizing bait. Um, you talked about, you know, redfish have really two kind of like main needs, if you will, or things that they're constantly thinking about. Do you mind talking about some of these similarities first and we'll go into differences based on state? Yeah, I mean, all, all fish, I mean, they're, I think uh, for many years I was all, you know, they they outsmarted me. Like I, I thought that, I thought they were smart and, and they're really, they're really not. All they do, they just react to the changing environments. And this is regardless of where they are. They're all just trying to get food and not be food to something else. So, so literally every second of every day, their number one, or I should say their only two thoughts really is, okay, where am I gonna get some food? And then where can I, where can I position myself so that I'm not gonna be picked off by something that scares me, dolphin, shark, or, or human. And so as long as we think about that, when we're picking spots, we're gonna significantly increase our odds of catching fish. What we did wrong for many years is we would just go to, the five or six spots that we've caught redfish historically without thinking about, is there food there, right? Am I seeing mullet? Am I seeing bait fish? Are there birds feeding in the area that I'm not, that I'm at? Um, so once I started kind of basically focusing more on that, where I'm looking for feeding birds and I'm looking for structure, and I would rather fish that spot that I've never fished before that has structure and has some, some life there, I would much rather fish that spot than a spot that I've fished for 10 years and caught a bunch of fish at that, that didn't have any life. So as long as just focus on the food, you're going to significantly increase your odds. And that was just one thing with Texas The as we were going from spot to spot, those bays were huge. So we did a lot of like long distance traveling and there'd be like 10 just amazing looking points with like five egrets just positioned right on the point, the wind blowing on it. And this was in the fall that we were there. And that was just like, Oh my gosh, like, there's got to be a bunch of redfish right there, but we would go past it. And then we didn't, you know, lo and behold, we'd end up at the spot that it was even better, right? It was just going from like good spot to, oh my gosh, that spot's amazing to now like the, like why right, that one spot we went to with all the birds, this is going to be the coolest picture ever. Like a whole big old thing of crow or blackbirds came up in the background, but there were pelicans diving, mullet jumping everywhere. Like if, if you just find a bunch of food that's near structure, odds of the and you're in redfish territory which is pretty much the whole southeast you're going to be catching redfish and uh, and it's it's surprisingly that easy um it's just like i think our our human minds kind of overcomplicate things in many ways and we kind of uh um we give the fish more brain power credit than they actually deserve because they, they're just reacting to, to the environment well a couple things that you missed one that redfish you said two things at some point in their life cycle they crank up the Marvin Gaye. Let's get it on <laughs> and do a little spawn, Goulet. Uh, yeah, so they do have that, and that's a whole that's, you know different uh, different thing. Yeah, that's when they get over slots. I'm just talking about most people. They just want to go out and catch fish, and, and the the once they get up to around 28 inches, that's when they start becoming the breeders and they actually start moving offshore. The the under 28 inch redfish, they're inshore all year long, and they're very easy to pattern. They do change around a little bit throughout the throughout the season, but they're going to be within within range. They're going to be within range for pretty much anybody who wants to catch them. So yeah, I, I was just focusing this on the on the ones that are that are there twenty four seven. So if they're so easy to pattern and they're so predictable and they're not smart fish, why are they so tough to catch sometimes? Because I think the human the human mind is what messes it up. It would be it would be my my answer to that. Yeah, I'd say it boils down to knowing what environment that you're in and the types of opportunities that you have. And that's going to be highly dependent on region. Redfish are very predictable in that if you know what type of habitat they're in, then you can predict what they're going to do. And there's areas of Florida that function exactly like areas in the Carolinas. And there's areas of Florida that function, you know, in the same areas that Luke's fishing in Tampa Bay that function exactly the same in Texas. It's just understanding whether you're fishing for redfish on grass flats, you're fishing for them in marshes, if you're fishing for them in jetties and passes and things like that, you know, each environment is going to provide different opportunities for fish and knowing what is the most prevalent type of environment in your area is very important. That's why all the scouting and, and understanding how to read maps and look at those overhead satellite images. We teach that a lot in the Salt Strong Insider Club is how to identify what type of area you're looking at on a satellite map 
and where those highest percentage zones are going to be. One of the easiest things I would say, regardless of any environment that you're fishing in, is looking for an area that bait is going to be congregated in. And that is in every state that I've fished in. I've lived in Florida. I've lived in the Carolinas. I currently live in Texas. That is the one overlap is that if you can find those highways of bait, those highways of food or current or tide or whatever conditions are going to move bait around and provide feeding opportunities for redfish around structure, like Luke's talked about, like points. Well, I'm sure we're going to talk about oyster bars. We're going to talk about potholes and grass flats. Any ambush opportunities where bait is going to be moved, those are all huge areas that you're going to find lots of redfish. Now, it might be spread out. It might be schools of redfish. It might be redfish that are locked into tide pools. There's so many amazing opportunities throughout the country. I think uh, the one thing that, because so, so many people have asked me when I, when I first started as a salt strong fishing coach, I was in the Carolinas. Now I'm in Texas. I used to live in Florida before that, but you know, the big question I get is what's the difference? I'd say with redfish in the Carolinas, it's a lot of marshes here in Texas where I'm fishing in Texas, there's a lot of grass flats and that's not the same uh, all throughout Texas. But big difference I find is that you're fishing schools of redfish for the most part in the Carolinas and the marshes by the tides and everything that, and I'm sure Pat's going to elaborate on this, but the opportunities when you have your best shot at redfish, you've got a lot of fish that are congregated in one area. And a lot of times in Texas, when I'm fishing for redfish, I'm finding a lot of fish that are spread out. I'm not necessarily on a school, maybe some parts of the year I'm on schools, but the majority of the time that I'm fishing for reds here, it's I'm finding high percentage zones where I can pick through areas and find loners or pairs that are just kind of searching for food. It's different approaches and different experiences in those different habitats that you're going to need to dial in on and structure an approach around. It's not a a geography based thing where you can only fish for Florida redfish one way or Texas redfish one way you're fishing for grass flats redfish or marsh redfish that's the approach that you need to structure when you're when you're really trying to come up with a plan yeah why well, pretty much uh, nailed it on the uh, hit it on the uh, head there with that uh, when I came to North Carolina uh, that was pretty much exactly it so when I travel from, you know, for you guys that uh, might not know, I'm actually a traveling fishing coach. I go all over the country, started in Texas, worked my way, uh, Louisiana, Mississippi, Alabama, uh, then went out the East Coast. But when I got to North Carolina, um, I consider myself uh, somebody that fishes uh, grass flats and marshlands. That's kind of my, my sweet spot. That's what I like doing. And I like to look for those areas whenever I go to a new state. So when I got into North Carolina, that's exactly what I did. I'm looking for marshes that has feeder creeks on it. That's near current flows and whatever that trend was. I just happened to be in North Carolina in August. So it was hot. Uh, so I needed to be, you know, windblown shorelines near, you know, bigger bodies of water. So you follow all of these trends and going back to the question, Joe, about, you know, these fish are so stupid. How come we, uh, you know, how can we have such problems catching them sometimes? Uh, I think that boils down to observation. You're not really paying attention to what's going on around. So if we, if we pay attention to the trends and if we pay attention to what these fish should be doing and what this weather's doing, there's just little changes that you might have to do to get on these fish. So one day, you know, if you're fishing this one grass line and you really do well, and then the next day you go back to it and you don't do well, uh, maybe it's because you're fishing in a different tide cycle. Maybe there's a different shift in the wind or something like that. So it's not the fish outsmarting us. The fish are doing what the fish do. We're just not necessarily paying attention to what the conditions and what the weather are doing and making those adjustments. Maybe the bait move, maybe they're in a different shoreline. You know, again, well, like I said, maybe you're fishing a different tide cycle and incoming versus an outgoing. Uh, so as long as we get those, you know, nailed down, uh, it makes our job much easier to catch fish. And if you fish today, it's very possible, regardless of where you are in the country, that Luke's trolling motor spooked the redfish. <laughs> it was very loud. Today. <laughs> that was the craziest thing I've ever heard in my life. Yeah, we even put Dr. Juice on it and uh, trying to get the, the oil. And it actually in, helped. Uh, it cut it down it like drastically. Oh, so every little small turn of the trolling motor, it was just like this, like this. <laughs> <laughs> oh, it was so loud. And Joel in the back with a camera, he's just like, guys, this is brutal. I was saying, it's funny you said Dr. Juice. I was having the same exact problem. I have a Hobie kayak, a pedal kayak, and the pedals were squeaking. Dr. Juice on there and took care of it. <laughs> <laughs> it worked. Yeah, I think was... we, got, we got a new marketing plan for the Dr. Juice. Yeah. <laughs> 
<laughs> yeah, well, there was like no wind, so like we couldn't drift into them. So yeah, it was uh, it was painful. But I'll elaborate on what Pat said because I think you nailed it. it it's it, I I think the the best equivalent, of the I guess the best uh, example I can think of is like a puzzle, right? Like like every day is a different puzzle, and like the tide might be a little bit different, or tides almost always be different. It's usually a fifty minute delay every day, but the wind could have changed. Uh, a dolphin could have just gone through there or somebody could have just fished it. There's so many variables and, and it's just about just keeping just keeping notice of the the various small variables and then putting it together, right? Putting it together and, and the more you can put the puzzle together, the quicker you're going to get and, and you're going to get better and better over time. So a lot of it is, is going out there and just observing what's going on, what helped me tremendously. The biggest game changer I ever had as far as going from, from one level to the next is when I stopped using my bait and I just forced myself to just throw lures because that forced me just to cover a lot of water and I was seeing just a lot more stuff. And then once I got into a good bite, I would start noticing trends on the areas that I was getting the bites, right? And it almost always was feeding birds, jumping mullet. And uh, and then over time, I was getting, now I just automatically look for those things. So it's like, it becomes like second nature. So it, it's, um, uh, we you know, obviously you need to know what to do but also just takes practice in doing so. And I think that's why like the inside reports have been so popular because literally every day our coaches go in and do the puzzle every day. Every day there'll be another puzzle that's posted where we do the pre-trip plan and then we go fish it and we talk about the environment, and the variables, and then what, what eventually worked at the end. Or sometimes it doesn't work and we talk about the, the things that we probably should have done. But it's just a, a way to, to repeat and, and do the puzzle uh, without having to actually spend, you know, a, a day on the water. So um, I think it's just that. It's like putting all the small things together, knowing that they're going to change, but but just kind of massaging that uh, that puzzle to 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 get to the point where you, you get into that 90-10 zone that we always talk about. And even today, there was one redfish caught on the boat. This guy. I was too busy spooking him with that trolling motor. <laughs> but you get, guess where it was caught? It was caught near a point, a mangrove point, where there was a bird. We happened to see a bird there feeding on some baits. Like, all right, there's definitely bait there. There's a mullet jumping all around. And that was the one red. We caught trout like until we were tired. We uh we filmed the whole oh cool podcast coming soon uh on the water where we uh just absolutely slayed the trout. But that was the one red and it was in textbook area. We probably would have we spooked more with the trolling motor. Yeah, we saw a ton. We finally yeah. put it together. They were they were they're basically it's still, you know, we had a cold front come in and they were basically in the wind protected bays. And then once we had enough water to get back up in there, we were on them, but they were on us way before we could get a lure in front of them. So that we just saw them waking like a cast and a half away from us. So um so yeah again uh, we we're in the right spot but the uh Human uh, intervention, meaning my trolling motor was uh, waking up the whole bay, uh, didn't help. Let's let's talk about favorite types of spots, not GPS spots, but types of spots. Uh, what do you guys think, uh, Wyatt? You're nodding your head. You got you got some favorites in in each of these these states, right? So I would say that again, breaking it down by habitat what's most prevalent in these different states so we'll start with north carolina my favorite type of habitat to go target redfish in and it it really boils down to again looking for where there's going to be large quantities of bait that's going to be moving through one specific area and redfish are in a type of environment that's easy for them to hunt in we know that shallow water is their game uh their their bodies are designed to to pin bait up against uh, a shallow shoreline or, or pin bait up against a grass line and just be really aggressive on it, whether it be shrimp or mullet, doesn't matter. Uh, and again, that bait changes throughout the year. But one area I was always very consistent in finding redfish in, regardless of season, was in the Carolinas, a, a marsh drain. And what that is, is where you've got a series of creeks or flats or whatever it may be that's in all of this, this grass. For those of you that are in the Carolinas, you know what types of areas I'm talking about. Um, those zones that are off the intercoastal channels, most of those marshes and creeks are somewhere between two and five feet. And some of the shallower areas are less than a foot and you'll see redfish tailing in those zones. The problem with the angler getting to those fish is those areas are not always accessible by boat or even kayak and it can be hard to see fish in all that grass because they're tailing they're digging around to make it easier on the angler to find the opportunity that's easiest to catch those redfish is i was always looking for lower tides that were going to 
take those fish out of the grass, take the water out of the grass, take the water off the flats and out of the creeks and concentrate them in one feeding zone. So wherever all that water was going to be moving out of those marshes towards the intercoastal areas through, you know, a shallow flat or around a corner or a point, oyster bar, whatever it may be, those were the areas that I like to target. And a lot of times in North Carolina, on those big points coming out of those marshes, you end up with big oyster bars. So, you know, if it was the warmer ones, warmer months, I'd be throwing top waters or running paddle tails really high. Once it gets a little bit colder, you'll see those fish that are near those points and near those drains. They'll sit in a little bit deeper water just to stay, you know, stable. And you're bouncing those paddle tails or those shrimp lures off the bottom. And those were the zones that I was always very consistent in catching redfish at. Um, Pat being there right in that type of environment right now, I'm sure, you know, in that type of habitat would would you say that that would be probably one of the number one spots to look for fish in the Carolinas or Georgia or any of those types of marsh environments you know when uh, Joe posed the question that's exactly the spot that popped up in my head whenever you answered it was uh you you know in the uh, in North Carolina you know I'll use North Carolina uh the sound that's there which is basically their intercoastal uh there's particularly uh, a few marsh drains that I can think of that uh, I spent a month up in North Carolina and they were consistent throughout and we actually had a, a seasonal change so when I got there it was full-on summer by the time I left it was early fall patterns so the fish had shifted but all they did was just move you know a little bit further into uh, the sound, so they went back to those uh, those creek mouths and those drains that you were talking about. Uh, but it was very consistent, and not only you know not only with redfish, I know that's what we're talking about, but you know also flounder trout they were in there too. But you know yeah that grass line, uh, even even specifically in Carolina for me, I like a falling tide, a high tide falling tide in that grass line at a drain to a marsh. It was that was almost money if you could find something like that. Uh, in South Carolina, when I uh, fished down there, I fished uh, Myrtle's Inlet a lot. And uh, that was actually uh, an opposite bite for me because what would happen, they have such uh, high tide swings there. So in South Carolina, you know, you're looking at, you know, a six, seven, eight foot tide swing. And there's a lot of difference of water between high tide, low tide. So what I did to, to minimize the amount of water they had to search, I like the last half of a falling tide at the first half of an incoming tide. So there was the least amount of uh, water that, to fish. So all the fish would, that would normally go back up to the grass, there was no water up there. So they would have to come down there. They have to wait for that low tide cycle to come out. And they would just congr congregate in the shallowest water that they could find. Uh, basically, they would come out the, uh, the, the creeks uh, only to just as much water as they needed to survive that hour, hour and a half of that low tide. And then as soon as that water started coming in, they would move back in. But, you know, for about three hours there, you had some really, really good fishing. So uh, it is timing. And then, you know, here in Georgia, it's a little bit different. I mean, we were, I think today was a 10 foot tide swing uh, when I was out there this morning. But, you know, what's funny is it's still, you know, there's not what your traditional grass flat, like you would call them Florida and Texas, but they're still flat. You just have to redefine what that looks like. So a flat in Georgia is basically a mud bank that comes off the river, maybe about 20, 30 feet off the, off the grass line, and then it drops straight down into 18, 20 feet of water. But the productive flats, the mud flats, are the ones that either have trees on them, hard structure, or oysters on the hard structure. So it's still a, a, a flat by by nature, by by the what you'd call it by definition, but it just looks different. But you know, the redfish still act the same. Good stuff. Yeah, I'll throw my, I have a different favorite spot. Mine's a little bit different. So I, I fish a lot of grassy bays. And so I, I look for three things. I just, I, in my, I, when I'm on the online map, whether I'm fishing in Tampa Bay area, I'm going down to Port Charlotte, or down to 10,000 Islands, up to Crystal River, or on the Atlantic coast, if I if I can see oysters, mangroves, and seagrass all in one area, I like, that's where I'm going. I don't care what time of day it is, ideally at twilight with topwater plug, but I, there's almost always going to be fish there. Redfish, obviously, number one, but also high chance of getting snook and trout, and so that's like my slam spot where I, every every chance I can get, I, if I can find that trifecta, that's always the first place I go um, in the morning. So, yeah, so mine, but if I'm fishing a marsh area, like the drains are hard to be like, that's what we did in Texas and, and the the marshy type areas that we fish. Joe, when we had that trip in Arapica um, with, with the YouTubers, it was all about those, those marsh drains. And, and it's yeah. really hard to get them at the high tide. You almost have to wait on the low tide to come out. But if there's a mangrove line with oysters, even at high tide, you have to kind of punch lures up under the trees a little bit, but they'll be feeding all day long. And so, yeah, that, that trifecta, that's, that's my thing. So uh, whenever in doubt, I go to a, the trifecta spot. Imagine how cool it would be 
if someone actually created an app or some type of software that would show you places that have oyster bars and seagrass and mangroves all coming together. Yeah, that's that's why smart fishing spots this is like the biggest game changer that that like that oyster layer it was by far the the coolest thing ever. Like I would have paid anything for that, you know, 20 years ago when when kind of learning learning things the hard way and and uh, obviously online maps like satellite maps you can see a lot of them but but there's i mean you can probably see maybe 25 percent or, or or maximum 50 in that oyster layer i mean now you can see them even in texas in like in murky water it's uh it's next next level and i yeah. i don't know if people understand how valuable that that is a lot of people don't and, and it's a lot of times like a new uh somebody new would join and and just explain that one thing is like hey just go to these oyster bars pick five of them go to them and like it's it's rare that like oh my gosh i, I just had the best day ever like that's usually what they're saying so it's that yeah. one little that one little form of structure is shockingly good and if right. you don't if you don't know what this is because I, I we've done podcasts a lot of times in the past where we talk about stuff that's kind of second nature to us because we've used it so long it's called smart fishing spots it is an app for insider members only it comes you know complimentary with with membership and there's a filter on there where you can zoom into your little area, wherever it might be. Texas, Florida doesn't really matter. And you can have these different filters. And two of them in particular, there's a bunch of them, but two of them in particular are oysters. So you literally hit oysters and it shows, it's a little gray. It shows you every single little oyster, uh, you know, clump from the big ones to the really small ones. And then you can also turn on seagrass at the same time. And it'll show, it's a bright green. And you just look for areas that have both. And obviously you can you know, see on the satellite map if there's mangroves or other little ledges. And then you can even use sonar with that which is going to show you the depths you can see that there's a depth change right near one like it's like it's just giving you where you should be fishing uh and then of course it does uh, do a next level which actually does highlight areas that you should be fishing based on the tides and the wind and temperature and all that great stuff um yeah. it's fantastic. funny you say that yeah. so oh, this it. is i was using it while we we're on the water and it still thinks i'm on the flat this was this was literally this morning and guess where you can see those little white dots there these are both very small oyster bars that i used to not be able to see with the normal map and guess where i caught the biggest trout of the morning right near that little white one right there right when it, i don't even want i don't want to tap it it's going to take the the icon away but but we are going upwind and it's going down towards these oyster bars and that's where do we catch the fish right right there like it's yep. it, that one that one little feature alone has is an absolute game changer for just anybody who who's putting the pieces of the puzzle together on a consistent basis especially if you're traveling new areas but yeah. that is that is this is it for for shallow water fishing like that's the best thing that i've seen of any program Right. And I, I think what's also really cool about smart fishing spots, I know it, it was a little bit of a complex subject when me and Pat just started talking about targeting those drains at different tide cycles. But that's one of those things that being on the water for so long, you see where fish congregate and at what that different time is. What's helpful on smart fishing spots is as that tide changes, as it's different times of year, thing, whatever it may be, it'll tell you when that area is going to be hot because those drains generally they have a lot of activity around them but specifically for redfish there is a time that you want to be there and smart fishing spots will tell you when that time is depending on the time of year depending on the tide wind everything that's extremely helpful because i will say you know as we talk about the differences between states you can get onto a lot more fish in one spot in those marsh environments like the carolinas uh, Georgia, South Carolina, uh, all those types of environments, it's very easy to catch a lot of fish in one spot. In the winter in North Carolina, I had days where I'd pull up to a spot the size of my living room and catch literally 30 fish back to back to back to back, every single cast. It's insane. It's not as easy to pick the right spots and know when to be there. It's it's a little bit more of an advanced topic uh, and, and an advanced approach. It takes a lot of time to learn. I'll say it's harder to catch redfish in those states because you really have to learn those time frames and you have to know how to select the spots better. All those marsh environments in the Carolinas, North Florida, Georgia, even in areas of Texas, those are harder environments to fish. That's my personal opinion. There's some folks that have fished those areas and that's their confidence zone. And that's where I started fishing. But once I switched to the grass flats, it became easier because it's a little bit more visual. And I'm sure we'll talk about that in a second. But 
the great thing about smart fishing spots is it makes those difficult areas a lot easier because you know when you need to be there and which areas are going to be productive because there are tons of drains in these marsh environments but smart fishing spots highlights the best ones and there are right ones to go target there's wrong ones to go target and if you've got 10 different drains it can get kind of confusing on which one you need to go to which one's going to be hot but the wind tide time of year all that's going to dictate which one you need to be at and what time you need to be there so looking at smart fishing spots solves all of that for you. Yeah, ever since I've been uh, traveling around uh, and we came out with the smart fishing spots, that's my cheat. I mean, that that really, it really is, you know, basically when I get to, you know, the next campground and I'm gonna launch the kayak, the first time I'm out on the water, I'm just trying to figure things out. I've never been there before. I'm going to the nearest smart spot. And it, it literally, what's the saying? You know, 60% of the time works every time. This is 100% of the time it works every time. And I don't think I've been to a smart spot yet that I haven't caught at least something. And uh, they've been really productive spots. And then with that information, I, you know, as I, as I fish an area, I can kind of, you know, figure out other places to go. But the smart fishing spot app is definitely uh, something that is, has took me to the fish. I mean, it's taking, taking me right there. Yep. Love it. All right, let's talk about lures versus live bait. We have tips at saltstrom.com. Uh, we have live on the water videos. We even have some courses on catching redfish, both on live bait and artificial lures. What are you guys' thoughts? Um, and maybe it's different if you're going after Mondo overslot reds in North Carolina. Maybe you need some cut bait. Um, I know personally, if I was trying to catch a state record redfish, I'd probably be using some kind of live bait or cut bait, um, and not, not a lure, but if I'm just trying to catch a ton, like, like you talked about Luke and just covering a lot of territory, probably go lures. What are your thoughts? Yeah, I'll, I'll start this cause I'm, I'm passionate about it. And I, I used to be live bait only. So this isn't like, I, I, I've never done live bait and that's, that's all I knew. And that's what I did. This was like in high school, college, where I had a lot of time to fish. Um, once getting into the real world, it was rare that I had like more than like four or five hours to fish. Now it's usually like two to three. And so lures have been a total game changer. So now I I, it's, I like struggle when I go to live bait now because I've been using lures so much. But to me, it's just lures are so much easier. Redfish and, and trout and snook, they're surprisingly aggressive. They're, they're, I would argue that they're more aggressive than than bass. And for whatever reason, bass anglers almost always use lures. And then inshore saltwater almost you almost always use live bait. If you can just find the good spots, if you can get yourself in a 90-10 zone where there's redfish there, they're gonna be chewing. Like, like doing tournaments, the trout were the ones that we had to focus on in the morning because those big trout were really hard to get to get to bite after like the, the twilight period where the, the best feed is. Because redfish, as long as you find them, that you can catch them in the middle of the day, even in the middle of summer. So for me, it's lures as long as you have a way to move around. Right. If you're in a kayak and you can move around and, and cover ground or in a boat with a with a trolling motor, it's it's just a numbers game. And, and if you have at least a decent lure and, you, and you're good about covering area and casting and you cast well, you're going to be catching more fish per hour than the people with live bait because they have to spend time catching the bait. Then it's, the bait slows them down. They can't fish as many areas as they otherwise could. So uh, I would say a lot of weekend warriors would be better off with lures because you don't know exactly where the bait is and you don't always know exactly where the fish are. And lures will help make sure that you get into as many different 90-10 zones uh, per hour of fishing. So I'm a huge proponent of lures. Um, and, uh, and, and I think that's, that's one thing that I wish somebody would have kind of hit me over the head with it uh, like 20 years ago when, when I wouldn't fish until I had a whole black, you know, whole live well full of, of, of bait. So um, uh, if, if anything, at least try it and, and just at least just know that that yes lures absolutely can work uh it's again just about getting good about putting the pieces of the puzzle okay because it is a little bit more complex you have to find the fish and then you have to figure out what they're feeding on but uh but once you get it and once you continue to practice you'll soon realize that hey i'm catching more fish with with lures why bother with the live bait stuff so but both yeah, work and, and i'll i'll add to that i'm I'm kind of not the right person to ask that question because I am a hardcore lure guy. Uh, I was just thinking about this. I was talking with our other coach, Richard, the other day. I think I've used live bait maybe five times in the past 20 years. I mean, I'm, I'm an artificial only guy, but um, I think if you're brand new to fishing and I'm talking about you're still learning how to cast a rod and a reel, 
it's hard to be, you know, a live shrimp on a hook because there's so many things that you've got to, you've got to put the pieces together. So if you're trying to find out where the redfish are and, 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 you know, the tide cycles and all that stuff, and you're trying to figure out how to work a lure, it can get kind of frustrating quick. So maybe to a brand new fisherman, uh, live bait maybe, but I would, I would, you know, go into uh, artificial uh, as soon as possible. And for me, it seems like Every time that I, I try to go either cut bait or live bait, you lose a lot of time, you know, getting that stuff, getting the cut bait. You know, you got to go to the store, you got it, then you got it. It's just, I can go right to the water, open up my tackle box and start throwing right away. You know, put my confidence lure on there and I feel like I'm going to catch something right away. So uh, to me, I, I'm going to throw artificial, but I would put the caveat out there. If you're brand, brand new to fishing, uh, probably, you know, a live shrimp on a hook. We talk about it all the time. It's, you know, everything eats a shrimp. It's great advice. And and I'm guessing part of this, why it is state specific, right? I know Florida in general for inshore saltwater fishing, like it, live baits always kind of been it, right? There's a, there's definitely a big shift coming. I mean, 30 years ago, like, right? No one was even talking about lures. Now it's a massive industry in the inshore saltwater. Thanks to Slam Shady, an Alabama leprechaun gold digger. Um, <laughs> but I mean, it really, there's been a massive shift over the last decade or so because of what you just said, Luke, people are realizing, man, it, it, it does. It gives you more freedom, more control, but you go to a place like Texas and yes, they obviously have anglers who use live bait for trout and reds, but it's not as big as Florida, like Florida here. I mean, it's the number one state for selling cast nets. And I mean, it's, it's, it's definitely different. So talk about that. Why, what, what you've seen since you've been over there. Right. And I, I do think that, as you said, it's regional. When you think about the approach to catch fish in certain environments, it actually can lend to your advantage, depending on where you are, to use lures over live bait. As you go to northern regions in Texas, where there are those, you know, those marshes and the drains, things like that, where fish are congregated in single spots and guides are trying to put their clients on fish very quickly, you see a lot of them employ live bait to quickly get onto those schools. And same thing in the Carolinas, Georgia. And even in Florida, there are a lot of those closed off areas where you got drains coming out of mangrove marshes, things like that. But as you go into further south in Texas, um, it's been a very big thing for a long, I, I would argue that artificial lures, flats fishing started in Texas. Uh, there's so much ground to cover you cannot sit there with a live bait presentation for hours on end and wait for fish and effectively fish those areas. Most of the environments in South Texas, it's just one large bay system with two sides. There are no little spoil islands. It's just big shorelines and open flats. So anglers adapted to that. They started using bass lures. And this is when we saw a huge rise in all of the different you know, soft plastics that evolved from big bass worms, sand eels, um, the paddle tails, top waters, everything. Anglers were trying to cover ground as quickly as possible on these shorelines. And we didn't really get a chance to talk about, you know, favorite types of spots uh, when we're fishing in, you know, grass flat types of environments. It's really just shorelines at high tide that have bait moving down the shoreline. Ideally, the wind is pushing bait down the shoreline, not necessarily directly into it because you end up with a cloudy shoreline, but in areas where you've got clearer water, where fish are used to feeding in clearer water, when you've got higher tides, those fish are up shallow, visually looking for bait, and that's how they normally feed. So you want wind that's keeping that shoreline clean. And a lot of times these anglers uh, that were just getting into using artificial lures, they found the easiest way to figure out how a fish was going to eat that bait was to actually watch it, sight cast at it and see which way they needed to work it to get those fish to feed. And I've put out a lot of videos recently within the last month or so about how I like to sight fish for fish here in Texas along these shorelines. And it's the same retrieve that I would use in Florida or any environment that's similar. These open shorelines are open flats, just triggering reaction strikes from fish. It's super, I mean, literally all you need is that uh, 2.0 paddle tail. I can get black drum, redfish, pretty much anything to feed if I can walk it a certain way across those fish's face. But the big key here is covering ground. And with artificial lures, you're able to do that a lot better than you can with live bait. So in some areas, yes, it is definitely better to use artificial lures than it is to use live bait. You'll see a lot of guides that go out and fish in those types of environments uh, that it's more productive to use lures. 
they may have a good day, they may not. And then the guys that went out with lures, a lot of times outperform them because they were able to cover more ground. Because there's such open shorelines, it's just about playing the numbers game. We talk a lot about the 90-10 zone. And like Luke said, there is a lot of bait here. There's lots of points. But there are some areas that are more productive than others, and you don't know until you get there. So you have to constantly keep moving, spend 10, 15, 20 minutes in one spot. If it's not happening, keep going. I'm always when I wade or when I when I troll, I'm always moving. I'm never standing in one spot. And even when I get onto fish, I really just change the speed that that I'm moving. I'll move slower. I, I rarely ever plant my feet and stand in one spot for extended periods of time. Because in the same way that I'm moving, looking for fish in these open areas, the fish are doing the same. They're looking for their next meal. So yes, I would say some areas, it is definitely more productive to use lures. It just depends on the environment that you're fishing and, and what you really want to do. Um, and even some, some fish that you're after, uh, it, it is more productive to use lures. With redfish, I find a lot of times if you're fishing potholes, it's harder to deploy a live bait presentation and, and fish those potholes. Even Luke, you know, we were down there fishing those piggy perch. It was hard sometimes if you got that fish too close to the edge of the grass, it would get tangled in the grass and you had to pull it in, pull the grass off, put it back out there with a paddle tail or an artificial shrimp. I could get in that pothole, pop it twice. If nothing happened, reel it back up, send it in the next one. And Luke ended up, I think the biggest fish of our Texas trip came on a bomber, just you throwing it in a high percentage zone. So there's there's no right way to fish for them, but I do find that there is more effective ways to do it. If you're trying to cover ground, uh, if you know the areas, you know maybe live bait could be better. But if you're trying to find fish, you haven't been on the water, you're looking to really get into the pattern of what fish are doing. Artificial lures by far, and I, I rarely use live bait. I do see you know some some advantages of it in certain zones, but for most of the areas that I fish, open grass flats, long shorelines. Um, I'm usually going to use our fish lures to cover as much ground as possible. You know, I'll, I'll change the, the question a little bit, um, because I think that, I think that might impact the answer. It, it's, uh, what would, if, if between live bait and lures, if you wanted to get better, if you were like really serious about, you want to get better at catching redfish, I, I think if, if that's the priority, I would say hands down lures, it's not even close because now you're covering more ground and you're going to, you're going to be putting those pieces of the puzzle together on finding fish more frequently and, and more consistently over time. You're just going to see so many more different examples because you're constantly moving uh, versus, versus with live bait. It's hard to get better because you're, you're just not seeing as much stuff. Um, so like my best improvement ever is after college, I moved to Melbourne, Florida. I never fished any river in my life. And at this point I didn't have the luxury of our parents uh, flats, but with a trolling motor, I got a kayak. And I didn't want to, I couldn't take all the rods I used to use, nor a cast net. And I had one rod. I chose one lure, the little, little jerk shad, the little jerk lure. And I would just paddle shorelines and just fish. And, and just seeing the different examples, that was by far the most improvement I ever had, like not even close. And that was just one year of lures was much better than the prior 15 years where it was all live bait. So uh, I think if improvement is the focus, lures is it if if you want to go out and catch fish a specific day that's when it's a tougher decision and if for newbies as pat mentioned that's when you i mean if you want to catch fish in one day and you don't really know the area light bait get a decent spot and you're going to catch something yes Whereas, shrimp everything eat shrimp right and yeah we, shrimp is hard to be we're using that in texas a lot of times with fishing those guides and yeah i mean everything eat shrimp and uh but if if improvement is the focus where you're going to have some off days right lures are tougher um, especially as you're learning, but if the improvement is the the number one priority, I would say don't use live bait at all. Just use lures, and you're going to see over time the quickest improvement. Yep, and we have help if you guys need it with all of that. The uh, I'd say the inshore slammer. I mean, the redfish mastery as well, but the inshore slammer was. You know, that was really the the core master course that we had. It's an online, you know, video based course. On, uh, on on really that transition on on how to catch inshore slams using artificial lures and the redfish mastery you know went really deep into that for just you know just redfish 
And then uh, all these lures, like Wyatt mentioned, the bomber, that's the slam shady bomber. And we have a, a couple of different bombers. It just means it's a it's a big boy. It's a five inch lure that cast a, a country mile, which is why it's the bomber. And uh, all of those lures, including some bundles, if you're just starting out and, uh, and, and just kind of want a pack of of everything that you need for your area, we have bundles as well all over at fishstrong.com. So fishstrong.com is our tackle store. Salt, boom, something in my throat. Saltstrong.com is the actual, you know, our online club. That's where we have all our fishing tips, this blog uh, for this uh, podcast, et cetera. And of course you can join there and get the smart fishing spots as well. It's saltstrong.com. Yeah, what else we miss, guys? Yeah. What else on the, on the redfish in these three states? I would say for improvement, I'll just, I think the quicker, the quickest way is to not worry about those courses, just the, the, the insider club, there's a finding spots mastery course, and then a position and approach mastery course. And between those two, that's the most streamlined way to go from a, a newbie to being in the top five, 10%, where you're going to know what to look for on the online maps, which is how to find the fish. And then you're going to know the positioning, whether you're in a boat or a kayak or even waiting if you can do those two things, if you can find the fish and position properly, you're going to be catching fish quicker than anybody else. And as part of that, you'll get the weekend game plan. So that's the, the, the easiest way and the least expensive way to get from wherever you are to being able to consistently catch fish uh, with lures. And for, for lures, we have that inshore tackle bundle, the ultimate bundle. And it's like 70 bucks for all the lures you're going to possibly need. And, uh, and pretty much all the situation, uh, not pretty much in all the situations that we just described. So that's like the most streamlined way that we've been able to find to get you from wherever you are to being able to consistently find and catch them. I'm glad you mentioned the the weekend game plan. That's really important for people to keep up with. If you're not able to be on the water, you know, two, three times a week, all of our coaches are out there observing the trends, seeing what fish are doing. And things do change from week to week. If a cold front rolls through, that can change where fish hold on shorelines or even on a flat completely or in a creek system. All those things can change and having somebody out there to update you with what's going on. Obviously, the courses are going to tell you what's going to happen. But if you haven't had time to watch them or, you know, you, you don't completely understand the theories yet, I would definitely recommend, like Luke said, watching those weekend game plans and also checking out the insider reports for your area. We have coaches all over the country, Texas, Florida, the Carolinas, Georgia, and we are covering every single week. Our coaches go out and show you a live report on the water of them catching fish, how they picked their spots, why they did depending on the seasonal trends, what the tide was doing, what the fish were feeding on, everything you need to know to create and structure a successful game plan out on the water for that day. You can replicate that exact same process. It doesn't even have to be at the exact same spot, but you can learn what the trends are, what fish are doing, and replicate that in your area. That's where I find the, the most help is seeing it in action live, like as recent as possible so that you can go out and, and know what the fish are doing when you want to go and be successful and catch them. Good stuff, gentlemen. Anything else? Are we part ways? Did we decide which state was better? I don't know. Do we? Do we <laughs> on that one? Oh, oh, got gazoo tight there. Uh, All right. Geez. So, for red oh, fish, I never, yeah, I was gonna say I never shared the the big thing that I think makes Texas. The, it's it all boils down to conservation. Texas Parks and Wildlife. I I apologize, but I I think out of any management state agency, Texas Parks and Wildlife has done the most research. They do the most stocking. They have put so much love into the fisheries, even when we have like freezes and stuff, they don't even allow people to fish because they want to make sure that the populations are, are kept in check. The reason there's so many fish in Texas Bay systems is because the limits and the way that the system is managed, that's what's contributed to a really, really healthy fishery here. And just them taking really good care of, uh, of making sure all the bay systems are stocked, uh, that they're studied well and that limits are adjusted based on what the populations are. I think that's what it boils down to. And I know you guys have a lot of really good stuff going on with FWC, managing stuff from red tide and things like that. Um, Texas and Florida are head to head, but I would say that Texas has the advantage. Um, a lot of FWC studies reference a lot of uh, Texas Parks and Wildlife studies from, from before they were really looking into all the data, but that's why I think Texas has the best fishery for yeah. reds. Anyone else thinks Wyatt may or may not be dating a Texas park ranger? <laughs> <laughs> 
I'm just a book nerd when it comes to all the studies. I reference all this stuff because I've done a lot of reading. I'm a book. Do you not see my 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 reading glasses? Those are good looking spectacles. Good yeah, specs. probably got that from that FWC person. Yeah. <laughs> Texas Parks and Wildlife, Luke. Texas Parks and Wildlife. If, if you've got uh, any pool out there, Wyatt, uh, see if you can get them to build more boat ramps. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> That's what they need. <laughs> That's part of the conservation plan. Exactly. Is not yeah. letting people don't you know, let them the, access it. The, the hard, the hardest part about fishing in Texas is actually getting to the fish. Other yeah. than that, it's pretty easy. Yeah, that's why everyone wait. You know, weight fishing so big there. It's like yeah, it's easier just to walk in the water versus having to find a, a place to launch a boat. Hey, if you can walk out from the ramp and catch your limit of redfish, then I'd say that's a pretty healthy population out there. Why is uh, as far as which state's better? Am I, I I still over for redfish? I perhaps Texas. I, you know, I might give the give the edge, but for overall inshore fishing, Florida still it for me. I, I just love snook too much to to uh, to even have a, a consideration to live somewhere where I'm not close to to snook and. So, uh, so my, my favorite thing about here is you, one cast can be a snook, like just like the last week, right? The, and I just posted a video this morning. It, within a 200 yard span, caught snook, redfish, trout, and tarpon all in one spot. And uh, so Florida is really unique in the fact that, that as long as you get into your good spot, there can be, a, 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 I would say, a, a more, more a different species, especially snook, which is my, my, by far my favorite. So Florida for me. Why it's going to say there are snook in Texas, you know? I'll let I'll let our South Padre insiders fill you in on uh on that. I'm not even going to say a word for for those of you that are that are down in South Padre. Please please fill Luke in in the comment section about how hard it is to catch snook down there. Oh, I'm and, going with and, Nathan and tarpon. They have you could do the same thing down in uh. Yeah, yeah, so Nathan, when I go down to one of our insider members, Nathan uh, Folks, who's a, just an amazing person, I, I talk to him all the time, and, and I love seeing his community reports. He he might have me swayed for Texas. I'm making a trip down there, and he he gets on giant trout, big snook too, and consistently catching snook uh, down there in Texas. So I'll do that trip, and I'll, I'll we, maybe we can do a repeat of this. But right now, for me, it's Florida. After that, after fishing with Nathan, it might change. So, so my argument for the Carolinas is with Pamlico Sound, it is your best opportunity or your best chance that you will get on a monster redfish using artificial. I don't think there's another place in this country that you have as good a chance as you can during that fall bull run in, in uh, Pamlico Sound. So that's my vote. Good stuff, gentlemen. Everyone, we want your vote. Please do comment. The best place is at saltstrong.com. You might even be there watching this uh, on the uh, on the actual blog post. So at saltstrong.com in the fishing tips section, you'll see this actual episode. And at the bottom, place to comment. It'll come right to us and we can all hear all of your, uh, hopefully put some funny ones in and some serious uh, answers on why you think uh, one of these states or any of those states in between obviously we cover these just because we have people who live there and are fishing there currently uh, but any of those states uh, in between is uh, as well except for Alabama I'm just kidding you can vote for Alabama uh, so guys thank you so much I uh, appreciate you big time got some really cool stuff coming for uh, for next year we kind of tease it on the next on the water podcast that we're going to be coming out with uh, so stay tuned for that and we appreciate you, and we'll talk to you in the next episode. Good job, guys. See ya. Peace.